All right, I want to welcome everybody to another installation of our exciting No Slides um, panel discussions. And this is our April installment. We're going to talk about outsourcing or automating or both and really practical solutions for firm leaders of all sizes of firms. So I like to um, start off by just letting every let's just let everybody self introduce. Um, Kelly, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, maybe just let us know. I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody knows you, but just in case they don't. And I think the size of the firm is important here. And um, whether you're kind of on team outsourcing or team automation or both. Okay. Um, so I'm Kelly Gonzalez. I am based in New York City. Uh, my company is called Totally Booked. We do uh, bookkeeping and accounting services for small businesses, uh, primarily e-commerce. Um, I am on both teams, I guess. <laughs> so I have outsourced in the past and I've had yeah. success with it. And I also use a lot of automation to do uh, the yeah. things that can be automated. So I feel like I fall right down the middle. Um, and it's me and Great. when I have overflow, just another contractor. Great. Perfect. Um, Heather, let's go to Matthew first because Matthew next. Um, and I have, there's a logic for why I'm doing this. So Matthew, over to you. Hi, I'm Matthew May. Um, I have a company called Acuity. Uh, we're out of Atlanta, Georgia. We're uh, cloud-based. Uh, we have about 150 people, uh, 50 of whom are internationally based through different either outsourcing partners or directly with us. And we definitely are on team automation uh, as well. So um, we have a great, uh, uh, I have a great colleague, her name is Patty Scharf, who has opened my yeah. eyes to process and automation in a way that I did not think was possible. Uh, so it's really fun having uh, her on the team and uh, she is a phenomenal <laughs> partner. Uh, yeah. so. Great. Maxine, let's go to you. Oh, come off mute. You got to, sorry, we, we went on mute earlier and then there we go. That's right. Maxine Morgan. I have a diverse background, CPA, also law and also higher education. And so I worked in higher ed for 20 years of all of all of these various years in the past and uh, also had a, a section of those that period that was full time. Yeah. So I I currently work with a select group of of clients doing advisory work. And I would say that I'm on team automation for sure. And um, open to open, outsourcing. Open to outsourcing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with Heather's, Heather's camera, but Heather, if you can hear me, just introduce yourself as well. We're not going to worry about any tech issues that we're having. Oh, okay. Go off. I had go. to shut, I had to shut my door because my husband just came home from a business trip and he was making lots of noise. So oh. <laughs> Okay. So um, <laughs> we never know what's going to happen in these webinars. We just don't know, do we? We have you no idea. All, yeah. We don't know. We don't care. We yeah. don't care. Yeah. So anyway, I figured that you guys didn't want to hear his conversation too. Um, so yeah, I'm Heather Satterley and uh, I'm a CPA. I uh, was in practice for many, many, many years. Uh, I am now the director of education and media at Woodard. So I've kind of refocused myself. I'm doing lots of automation over there. Um on my processes, but I am definitely a team automation. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to explain why I've got this, why I invited this gang of people to join me on this, this conversation today. Um, one, I wanted a lot of different opinions and, and backgrounds. Um, and then the other thing is, is that two of you, actually three of you, I'm sorry, there's three of you that do regular, gosh, maybe four of you, maybe you all do regular teaching. You all do regular teaching and training on these topics. And so um, it's a, it's an interesting perspective when you're doing it for yourself and you're learning it, uh, kind of figuring it out. There's also this concept of who do you turn to for help when you need it? And then when do you sort of start, when do you feel like you've got enough knowledge where you can sort of teach it? So I just feel free to talk about those experiences as we go through. Um, so. One of the things I want to do first is find out who is in the audience. So we're going to pop just a quick poll. Um, so the first poll we're going to talk about is automation. So hopefully I have popped the poll and I want to ha have you answer. Honestly, we cannot see who's answering what. So please be really honest here. 
Um, are you, how would you describe your level of automation in your firm? Are you highly automated, somewhat automated, or not automated at all? And we're going to give that, looks about, about 80% of you. We'll just give it another few seconds. Please answer if you can, because it's, it's really, it's really going to help us figure out where the audience is and where the heat is today. All right, I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. So count it to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and then we'll share it. So uh, hopefully all of you can see that 72% of you are somewhat automated. There's a minority of 11% that are highly automated and 17% of you are not automated at all. So thank you so much for sharing that, for, for sharing that with us. So we're, we're, we've got people that are kind of like they're doing some of it, maybe not, maybe not as much as, as they want. Okay, so let's talk about automation. So Heather, I want to ask you, start with you. How much do you think is too much when you consider automation? Or is there? And, and Matthew, I'm going to flip to you in a second if you have an alternate opinion, because I know Patty is like on the cutting edge, bleeding edge of automation. So Heather, how much do you think is too much or is there too much? So I do think that there is too much. And where you start to dip into the too much realm is when you start to lose the personal touch in your communications with your clients and the people that you do business with. So um, I think that you have to be really careful. And this is something that when you get really excited about automation, that sometimes you don't stop to think about, is this something that should be automated? And how is the person on the other end of this automation going to react to yeah. it? So I think that, you know, when you're, I think that's really the focus that you should be looking at is just because it can be automated, is it going to affect a relationship? And if it is, then you need to kind of really think that through and make sure that 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 it makes sense from that end. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matthew, what would you add to that, or or what, or would you counter that in any way? I mean, I know Patty is pretty thoughtful about. At least it seems like she is about how how she's rolled it out. So, how have you been thinking about that in your term in your in your firm? I think of it like a dial, right? And in, in anything, you just uh, if it, as like your strengths become weaknesses when you overdo it, right? So mm -hmm. you have to dial it back a little bit. No, the so I, I I'm kind of in agreement with Heather there. But the thing I will add is <laughs> one of the limitations of automation is maintaining the automation because typically a different person likes to maintain and build. Uh, so um, as you create custom automation automations for clients, um, that that's that it's it's easy to maintain um, at like ten. 20 clients when you start getting into the hundreds of clients yeah um you have to think about should this just be the same automation and then you're just getting 80 percent of the way there right because you can only kind of automate 80 percent of the way there across a like a vast group of people uh so i would just say one of the limitations when you start thinking about it at scale is the maintenance and uh, what you're, what, what are you trying to do? Because maintaining it, at, if it's like individual customer by customer at hundreds of clients, uh, because it becomes worse of a deal than what yeah. you were trying to, the efficiency you gained. Yeah. Um, Maxine, I want to go to you now. What, um, as you look at your practice, you said you're, you're really starting to think about what you should automate. Um, what are you thinking about automating in your practice or what have you done so far? Um, and you're on, you're on mute, now, Maxine. I'm going to have to remind you, come off mute. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have used Lysio for some of the automation, right? In okay. terms of tasks, right? And um, so auto reminders. It, so reminding people of when, reminding clients of when things are due. That's a great example of something that can be automated. Exactly. Um, and how are you making that personal for your clients so that you're not, you know, um, making it an impersonal sort of automation? Well, I, I do reach out to them at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is this, um, and you know what the, the client group that I'm working with is quite manageable. And so they do get the opportunity to, to experience that personal touch. Yeah. Me, right. And, and is so there, 
Ian, is there anything else that you're considering? And, and we've got a question from the audience to be quite specific about what you're automating. So Maxine was just very specific about automating the reminders to clients to do tasks. So um, what are what other things are you thinking about automating in specifics? So in terms of my workflow tool, mm -hmm. the automation that is set up within the tools are helpful okay. to me. So yeah. they're, they're, they're um, moving tasks or the workflow from one task, one aspect of the entire project to the next yeah. automatically without a person being behind that function. Right. So when one task is completed, another one is. And do you mind sharing what workflow tool you're using? The, the tool is uh, Carbon. Carbon. Okay. Yes. So using Carbon. Okay, great. Yes. All right, Kelly, let's move over to you. Um, do you remember what pushed you to actually want to, um, to uh, um, sorry, just a minute. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Do you remember, I was just putting, we've got a little bit of feedback on Maxine's mic, so I'm just putting her on mute when, <laughs> when, when we need to, yeah. Um, do you remember what pushed you to want to automate some of your work and where did you start? And again, keeping in mind that audience is wanting specifics about things okay. to automate. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna point a finger at Heather. She's below me. Uh, so Heather definitely <laughs> probably like triggered my um, automation bug, maybe, you know, back in the day, uh, probably about six years ago. Um, and the first thing I think that kind of picked my interest was actually Zapier, uh, just kind of learning how to automate yeah. between different programs and kind of tie things together. Um, and then as like today on a more, I guess, daily basis, the stuff that I'm automating is a little bit more in depth when it comes to client work. And so like the Zapier stuff and the automations there were more about my firm, maybe communications, maybe some reminders or um, being able to kind of personalize something so that it didn't look like it was automated, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then now I'm using it more like I want to make sure that, you know, Shopify syncs automatically to QuickBooks and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think to touch on like some of the communication stuff, keeping it a little more personal, being able to use something like Zapier and put somebody's name in an email or a reminder, um, or even just communicating to my clients and telling them that, you know, you're going to get this auto reminder every month kind of helps. Um, and so like Maxine, I use Lissio for those things, right? So like on the communication side, it may be, I think Alice and me joke, but like auto badger, right? Like they're just going to keep getting uh, we do call people, it, I do call it auto badger. I don't think that's yeah. approved actually by the, by the brand, by the, well, by the team. I'm, I like yeah. it. Uh, but it so, takes yeah, the, but it's it true. It takes the mental load off of you, off of you exactly. when you have your, your main software and it can right. be your workflow tool. It can be a client community, a dedicated client communication tool like Lissio. It can be yeah. other things as well, but reminding your clients to do things. That's one of the, the simplest things mm -hmm. that you can start to automate. Um, right. My CRM does it too. So I use mm -hmm. HoneyBook for my CRM. And if it's where I sent a contract or something, you know, an engagement letter that they need to review, it'll remind them. It'll remind me that it reminded right. them. Um, those kinds of things. So like, those are like the little baby step automation things, I guess that you can, that you can do. Uh, but yeah, I think what started me on it was, it, it was fun. It was a project. So I was like, Oh, what, you know, what can I kind of eliminate in the stuff that I have to do and replace it with what can the tech do for me? And I just kind of kept going down that rabbit hole. Yeah. I, I actually, when I was actually tasked with, we're just, we're just releasing Zapier for with Lysio, by the way, which is a good integration. So Zapier is a really good place to go and Kel and, um, Heather, just confirm you still have your Zapier course available for people to take. Do you, you, are you still? I haven't. I haven't I'm not. Haven't been teaching it for a while. Okay. But will be. I will be launching it you, again. Okay. Next. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure people understood that there's a lot of and there's a lot of resources on the Zapier site, by the way. Um, but I decided to do something super simple and just just create a Zap when Chris, my my CEO, when he emails me. I don't, I don't want to miss an email from him because it's always like super interesting and there's always some interesting thing in there and it's probably a to-do, right? And I don't want to miss it. And so that was so easy for me to do that I was able to just create this app and it pops it into Slack and I can see when he, so you can sort of think about the things that maybe it's like if you had a super important client or you had some someone that you were, you just needed to make sure you were taking care of really well, you could, you know, you could make a zap. 
So let's go to, um, I'm just looking at the questions here that we prepared um, beforehand. I think one that I am a little bit excited about asking is to Heather, and it's about what processes should not be automated. And you mentioned earlier a little bit about, about the, the personalization and things, but really what should you just say, absolutely not, do not automate that? Um, so I'm gonna say this because I believe this is now. And I think that eventually in the future that we will be able to automate it. I strongly believe that, but the review process. So going through the review process, the okay. review process of things, I think that you can automate parts of the review process. And what I'm talking mm -hmm. about is validating um, that certain tasks were done. So if, and I'm going to say this, if you don't have an integration that's doing the reconciliation and the validation for you. So there's certain things where you need a set of eyes on it to make right. sure that things were done in a way that, um, you know, that, that maintains the quality within your firm. Right. So and I suppose if you're, if you're, if you're a solo, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, Maxine and Kelly's mm -hmm. thoughts about that, because how do you catch like your own errors? Let's go to you, Maxine, first. Um, I'm going to take you off mute. You go ahead and take yourself off mute. And then if you could just tell us, how do you, how do you verify you know, your own work, like, do you use, do you use checklists and things or like, where would automation fit or not fit in there? Yeah. So to verify my own work, I pretend to be two people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so today I'm person one and then tomorrow. So you got Maxine later. on the one hand and Maxie on the other. A few days Max. later. Max and Maxine. <laughs> Yeah. A few days later, fresh eyes, fresh brain, you know, alert, yeah. and you know, as if I'm looking at it, um, yeah, new, right? So okay. that's that's one of the ways that I do verification, and then of course checklists. I think that um, it's helpful to to build roadmaps. Yeah, about mm -hmm. a roadmap that correlates with certain projects, all the various steps mm -hmm. that are involved with certain projects, so that you you make sure that you you touch all you got that consistency yeah all the yeah. Yeah, consistency work yeah. consistency um a pattern that is repetitive that not repetitive but a pattern that um you follow all the time you can replicate yeah. like a repeatable replicatable exactly. process and i and yeah. i think and i think that uh, the workflow tool is very helpful with that mm -hmm. because once a template is created once you've decided that that's your template and you are consistent with applying that template, that's going to help prevent yeah. people falling through the cracks. Yeah, that's wonderful. Kelly, you also uh, sometimes are working, it's just you. So how do yeah. you think about, do you automate anything in that process or do you use a similar I thing? I, I feel like I automate this stuff before it. So if I'm doing, like I find it, if we're talking about accounting specifically, right? So when I'm reconciling the bank, that's kind of where I catch all the things. If there was something, the, let's say it was mapped wrong on one of my mm -hmm. integrations or some, unfortunately, I'm probably going to catch it in there. Um, and then checking the reports and stuff like that. So the, the after part is kind of when I've already done all the stuff. And so it's, it's still just me. Um, <laughs> I have a workflow tool that I use called motion. Uh, and I put, you know, my clients and the different steps and maybe some reminders and stuff in there. Um, and my Google calendar and every, yeah. everything links on there. So that's probably as far as I go with automation on checking on things, but it's, yeah, I would say it's still, it's still me. So <laughs> if it's something where I either made a mistake or I'm confused, or let's say I'm stuck, I yeah. call someone for help. Like, Hey, I need a fresh set of eyes. I am, I am completely confused about what I'm doing mm -hmm. wrong here. And it's usually Kristen. Um, and Kristen will be like, uh, yeah, I could see where you went wrong. You put this over here. It should have been over there. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, of course. So yeah. if we're going to, we, so I think what I'm hearing from this to recap is that you can't, there's, there's the, in the review process of making sure that things are really accurate, it's not entirely and really probably shouldn't be automated the whole thing, but Kelly, go ahead. I was going to actually call out Matthew because I feel like he might disagree. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to Matthew next because one of the things in the prep work that Matthew <laughs> shared with me is that they actually have two dedicated people focusing on process and automation. So Matthew, I want to hear about this now, given that you're a 150 person firm. So your, 
your your evolution and your 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 needs and your challenges are just they're probably a lot bigger than a lot of people maybe on the on the call but how, tell us about that you've got two people focused on this yeah i mean i guess the progression for me uh, automation is so blurry with consistent process so we use a tool called process street to document our processes and then we use tools like zapier uh, once we identify a step that can be more efficient with automation to build some kind of automation and then right. we're able to apply that across our client base and, and 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 do that so i guess our evolution was to first identify the things that you had major processes for and we've done this for client work we've done this for employee onboarding we've done this for employee offboarding we've done this for changing um like we had somebody quit this week so we have to reassign all of their clients we have a client reassignment process that we use and part of that's automated uh, now we, today we use it like to optimize how many people have salesforce licenses so our mm -hmm. crm is salesforce which is a little bit of an expensive license for mm -hmm. for us and <laughs> so, you don't want you don't want everybody in there if you don't have to have them in there that's so, right so yeah. we use automations to get people the information they need and we only mm -hmm. have to have 25 salesforce licenses for a 150 person firm right. And then we protect right. the data in Salesforce as well. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's well, kind I love of the, the, focus, the evolution. Well, I love the focus on identifying your processes first. And I think that's where I, I think as I think about, I am actually, funnily enough, a process for me is a learned behavior. I, I have to force myself to go to process because I'm all about the new and shiny and, oh, we could do this and, oh, we could do that. And I'm all about the outcome and not really about how we got there. And so... I need people who are very, very good with process. I'm really lucky with Tavita. She's, although she, being Canadian, both of us, I say process because I've been in the States for so long, she'd say process. So for my Canadians, process. Um, she's so good at it and she can break it down into, uh, and so uh, um, Ryan is just asking what the process mapping tool, it's called Process Street. Is that yes. the, the name of it? That's process. Right process street. So having a really good tool is really important. Um, at Lysio, um, we actually have, an, it's a team. This is just, just how, I, how we manage our team. We actually take, we call it time to complete. Are any of you guys looking at the time to complete for a task? Oh. So have you heard of this, 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 it's a really, really good concept. And actually it's probably the only thing I'm gonna jump into and actually like talk about as a panelist here. So when you map out your process, you yeah, time, Penny saying time and clicks to complete. It's it's so it's the time and the clicks. And maybe how many times you have to context switch, which is the what they call the toggle tax. And so you want anytime you can you can create something that's automated and gonna create a good experience for the client and the and the staff, maybe save some money as Matthew is, and reduce that time to complete, then you start really looking at where you should be, where you should be automating. So it's a really great place to start if you if you really don't know you know what you know where where you've where you've automated. Um, so Kelly, before we kind of shift over to um, offshoring slash outsourcing, and I know we're going to weave all sorts of things in, um, I wanted to ask you about what are the, some of the essential apps like you had mentioned Zapier. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the other essential apps that you use to automate things um, and that you teach others to automate? Yeah. Um, so. Everything in my world, I always say, kind of connects back to QuickBooks in some way, shape, or form. So anything yeah. that's client related and going to autograde or auto autograde automate or uh, autograde is fantastic. Autograde right, is automating words. and integrating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I look at kind of what the client's needs are, but primarily for let's say like my e-commerce clients, everyone is on Cinder. Cinder will connect to stuff like Shopify, um, Etsy, eBay, et cetera, Square, whatever, and then pull all of those things into QuickBooks, but the way that I told it to. So what right. sales account, where does sales tax go, that kind of stuff. Um, and so- and, and Bookkeep is another good one, I think. Bookkeep that, is another but, option, that yes. Could, yeah. So for Absolutely. automating, automating e-commerce sales, and just mm -hmm. let's just stop, just stop for a second, because what are you automating there? You're automating the daily sales receipts, right? Right. Daily so you sales, sales receipts, yeah. you can do it um, daily or you can do every um, per transaction. So like every mm -hmm. sales receipt coming in. Um, and so it's bringing in, like I said, like stuff like sales um, tax, like so, um, sales tax is another one that we have to worry about. Uh, 
I know for Kristen, like if it's a restaurant, you have to pull in stuff like tips. And so like any type of um, payment processor that you're pulling through, uh, which then brings me to tax jar, which is another one that's automated. So as it starts to accrue, let's say a sales tax that my client has to pay, we can automate the sales tax return. So it'll create the return. It'll file. It'll make the payment. Wow. It'll tell you when there's a nexus being created in another state. Um, and there are several. So Avatax is one. Uh, Davos is actually a really cool one for um, brick and mortar restaurants, yeah. stuff like that. Um, tax jar is another option. I'm sure you guys know of more, but these are the ones that are first. And you had mentioned mind. Honeybook. Yeah. Honeybook okay, is my, yeah, Honeybook is my CRM. And then the cool one that everyone gets excited about, but Heather gets total credit for this is Zapier. Zapier. It's probably every day, but it automates my replies to my leads. So anyone that comes in from the QuickBooks Pro Advisor site gets an mm -hmm. automatic reply that says, hey, I'm so excited to talk with you. Here's a link to my calendar. You know, let me know what you had in mind, that kind of thing. And so it turns most of those leads into actual appointments because yeah. I'm responding to them immediately, which is yeah. pretty cool. That's that's so great. Um we're going to, by the way, we've, we've just had an ask if we're going to, for recording this and sending it out. Yes, we are. And the other thing I'll do is I'll get from the panelists, all of the apps that they mentioned, and we'll list them out. Um, I did put some of those in a poll later on because Kelly pre-shared with me some of them that she was going to share. So um, we may, our poll may be, may be inadequate. Um, okay. So let's go to, um, I'm just sort of looking, let's do, let's do another poll because um what I'd like to do is I'd like to find out where all of you are, are at in your staffing challenges because we're gonna we're gonna shift and spend a little bit of time about talking about um, about outsourcing and um, slash offshoring different names and I'm gonna ask Matthew to uh, I'm gonna ask him first while we're doing this poll to think about the answer of what's the difference between outsourcing and offshoring so in just a second we'll we'll go to that. So we've got about half of you in the poll here. So, so far finding and height. So the, the question is, what is your biggest staffing challenge right now? And the first one is finding and hiring qualified employees. Uh, re second one is retaining current employees. Third one is divvying up the work between existing. And in other, putting in the chat, there's a few that are coming in and this is really good. Um, um, we've got some training issues. Some folks are staying solo. That's absolutely fine. We, you know, um, quite a few of actually that are staying solo. That's a very, very valid choice. Um, all right. So I'm going to give it another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right. So let's go ahead and share the results. Um, and finding and hiring qualified employees is the biggest one, followed by divvying up the work. All right. So Matthew, let's go ahead and talk about um, there's outsourcing and there's offshoring. And I think you had said, well, let, let me ask you, we had talked in the, pre, in the prep about the difference between the two. Is there a difference or are they interchangeable? I, I think some people use them interchangeably. I think of outsourcing as using a third party partner um, to go internationally, um, somebody that, and, and maybe they're not even international. So that that to me is outsourcing. Offshoring to me, I think can kind of consume that uh, if that outsourcing partner is international and it also includes anything you do directly. So that's that's how I think of the world. I think offboarding, offshoring is a little bit more encompassing in some ways. Uh, outsourcing theoretically that could be in the US. I think what we're talking about is kind of sending stuff international in a lot of or, cases. Well, or or just or just finding another another you know a, a partner firm to work with is also this concept of co-firming that came up in one of the webinars I was in previously, um, where two firms decided to join and they had and they just refer and share each other's clients to each other. So that's kind of an interesting thing. So that's different, but okay. basically it's these folks are not your employees, right? And and however, um, Matthew, you did tell me that. Um, you're, you've actually got an interesting twist to what's happening. You've been, can you tell us about um, your outsourcing partners, who you use, feel free to sure. name names, and I, then I what the history is? Sure, we started outsourcing uh, using a company called TOA. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the wonder, outsource and, accountants, yeah. The outsource accountants, great partners. Uh, I think Nick is coming up on an upcoming webinar. You May third, yeah. And actually, so. I'm going to ask Davida to put the um, the link in there because if anybody wants to go deep on, uh, well, she'll put it in the in the chat. Um, anybody wants to go deep on and ask Nick Sinclair some specific questions, um, he's going to be May third on on a webinar with us. Yeah, last time he was in Atlanta, we had breakfast here, so it was great to see Nick. Great guy. Um, but yeah. um, the uh, at the same time as we did TOA, we we did two people directly. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 in the Philip and both of those relationships were in the Philippines. Then we did a merger and had a second partner join called Nimble. Nimble. Uh, so so Nimble and those folks were different from they were working opposite time zones. So they were working U.S. nights, Philippine days. Our mm -hmm. TOA and our direct em, uh, employees in the Philippines before that were working uh, U.S. days, Philippine nights. And then we added, because we're never boring, uh, a, a company in St. Lucia called Grow Resources, uh, where we uh, we have about, in, in order of magnitude, we have about 17 people with Grow Resources in St. Lucia. Uh, we have about, I think we have about 11 people with TOA right now. Uh, I think we have about 12 people with uh, Nimble. And I think we have seven or eight people direct now in the Philippines. Yeah. And we're in the process of setting up our own acuity philippines subsidiary uh so that's that's our journey yeah it's it's an interesting one and I'm, I'm just watching the chat here you're probably seeing it all come in um there's a few people that are saying um you know andrew says he ran into issues with insurance um and the need to let all of his customers know so um i'm going to stick with you matthew because you've got the most experience with this um, how did you find, was there an issue with insurance with your firm or, or was that, what was that process like? We haven't, we've been very transparent, um, first of all, all along. So if we have employees or outsourced partners in the Philippines, in St. Lucia or anywhere in the world, we have people in Greece and Argentina too, mm -hmm. uh, but they're direct one-off kind of deals, but um, they're able to talk to clients directly. Yeah. So in our terms and service, it says, these are the partners we use. These are the countries our people live in. We've been really transparent with our insurance carrier. Mm -hmm. And we actually haven't had any problems. Now I'm not a CPA firm. So I don't know if that was a specific CPA firm kind of problem. Um, so Acuity CFO is a, is not a, a even though I'm a CPA. Yeah, it, it's Andrew's not a CPA, a CPA firm. firm. Yeah, and I so. think it matters what state you're in as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Well, we have a lawyer on the on the on the call, so we could ask Maxine. <laughs> Weigh in anytime, Maxine. Oh, he's in Canada. Yeah. So there are different rules. I think I think you need to you need to come up to speed on that. Maxine, what would you add? I saw you were going to come off mute. Oh, oh no. I I I think it's a good question, and I would imagine that uh, there might be some issues i'm not saying bad issues but uh whatever the issues might be the um insurance companies would want to be aware yeah. and i'm wondering i'm asking myself if it would impact the premiums yeah i think it's a great question um we have a good relationship with mcgowan pro and they are one penny penny is penny breslin's chiming in yes it does um, so these are the questions I think that you need to make sure that you understand the disclosure laws in your state. I would imagine that your state CPA society or your accounting organization can help you with that. Um, whether it's going to impact your premiums. Um, so you're going to want to have a chat with your, with your, you know, with your, would it be errors and omissions, uh, general liability might even be cyber insurance. You need to check with your insurance carriers. Um, and then fully, and then I think understand as as Matthew did, um, you know what you're going to tell your clients and how you're going to frame that up. Um, personally, I don't mind working with folks all over the world as long as I'm going to get the answers I need. That's how I feel about it. And then Byron is sharing a really great. Um, he says if you're not comfortable sharing it with it, even if not required to, then outsourcing probably isn't for you. <laughs> that is a very good, a very good. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and find out um, where the, let me see, sorry. I just wanna look at my polls here and let me find out. Let's find out from the, um, uh, from uh, go ahead and launched uh, poll 2.5 here. Um, regarding um, 
outsourcing and offshoring, what statement best describes your firm? So we're opposed to it. We will be not, not be doing it. We are considering it, but haven't implemented it yet. And we're already using this staff, staffing method in our firm. Let's find out where everybody is at. Um, and those of you that are opposed to it, I would love it if you would put in you in the chat um, why I share share what the share what the issues are. Um, alternatively, if you are using it and you're absolutely delighted, um, and thank you, Matthew Toa and Nimble in the Philippines and Grow Resources in Saint Lucia, um, Saint Lucia, Saint Lucia. And it's it's much Where, is that easier near to near Barbados. Yeah, it is. It's it, and uh, we never have a lack of people volunteering to go to Saint Lucia to train people. I have to say, so <laughs> it has become a rite of passage to uh, be able to go say, uh, I need to do training for folks in Saint Lucia. So we have a great team in Saint Lucia. A great team. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that that's the case. It reminds me when I it reminds yeah. it reminds it reminds. You'll go, yeah. It reminds me of when Scaling New Heights was in uh, was in the Bahamas. Um, okay, um, so we've got fifty one percent that is considering it. Twenty six percent is opposed, and twenty three percent is uh, already using it. Um, and now let's read out some of the chats because this is really interesting. Um, Jonathan says the sales manager says the clients are reluctant to work with us if we offshore. Uh, William says can't find good people in the U.S. So basically offshore, that's great. Um, I've used tax file this season, not as happy, not quite sure what that's about. We're a high value firm. Andrew, I'm concerned with the insurance. Yeah. Alisa was opposed, but once talked to others, there we go. Uh, she dipped her toe in it and loved it. Yeah. So there's a really interesting, there's a really interesting thing. It's like, I think there might be some stigma around around it um, that maybe needs to be um, to be un, um, unstigmatized, if that's a word. Yeah, I can, I can, oh, I can address that as well, because yeah, go um, ahead, Matthew. The, kind of the journey people work on, like we went through was like, okay, when we were like, okay, we're going to outsource. And then you like threw it out there. You, you like, like, I don't know what we expected, like things would just happen and people would not quit jobs and they weren't human and didn't have families and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden there was this aha moment for me. It's like, this is just people who it's just people. live other places mm -hmm. and going to the Philippines and being on the ground with our whole team, going to St. Lucia and being on the ground with everyone. It just makes you realize, Oh, wow. Like these are just people. They have spouses, they have kids, they have parents, they have, they have, lives and they yeah. want they they have new they have career path trajectories they're expecting they're expecting promotion paths like and once you're like two or three years into this if you're not ready to promote people and get them moving you're going to have a turnover issue it's just yeah. fast it was just i don't know why we were so naive to that in the beginning yeah because i think you think it's going to be you're only going to be dealing with like one person um so i i have a long history with outsourcing we were doing it in 2004 like that long ago and it was really great. We used a firm, it, they were based in India and we basically had all of the bookkeeping done and they would, because they were 12 and a half hours ahead of us, they would do, they'd be working while we were asleep and vice versa. And there was a little bit of an overlap where we would, where we would, we could talk to each other. Um, but we were dealing with individuals, not one person, right? And as long as, and this is why I wanted to start with automation first, as long as we had really great processes, processes, for my Canadians processes, sorry, processes for my Canadians processes for my Americans. As long as we had really good processes in place and we had the review, which is why I want to talk about the review. How did we review things? And Heather, you lobbed that easy ball into my lap about you want to make sure you're not, not automating the review. Um, it was a really delightful experience and everyone was really happy. Now, Maxine, when we, when we first did the prep, when you and I first talked, we talked about, and this is where you're coming. I was, so really want to put you put your university hat on. Um, we've all see in the news that the accountants are leaving the profession at this incredible rate, and I think that's caused the crunch for staff. One of the one of the things. Um, but what do you think is the main reason that people are leaving the profession? 
Um, and the reason I wanted to kind of tie it into outsourcing and offshoring is that there are a lot of a lot of talent available in other countries that aren't leaving the profession actually, and they see it as a really great way. So why do you think, and you mentioned that the universities aren't preparing people properly. So can you tell us what you think, what, what your thoughts are on that? I, I think there's so many reasons. I think one, it's, it's burnout. The burnout is a factor. I think they're not uh, being, they feel that they're not being paid enough. They feel that they're not um, mm -hmm. able to have a work-life balance. Mm -hmm. They feel that the, the work is not that interesting. You know, they, they, uh, they want to be able to apply different skills. And I also think that a lot of uh, new graduates are seeing many other options, right? So they're gravitating yeah. toward other options. I think that when I was uh, a recent graduate many, many, many years ago, we didn't really see that many options. And so I think that they see options that check the boxes for them. Um, yeah. Also, you, you mentioned the universities and the preparation. There needs to be a collaboration between industry and educators. Educators, yeah. I believe, need to heighten their awareness of what's expected. Yeah. By and I think, yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing is, is that what's really interesting to me in this conversation is if you have the right mix of outsourcing and the right mix of, tech, of, of automation, you actually could create for your in-house people a really exciting career where they're working on higher value work. And I think that's something where I'm hearing across the board that the younger, the younger staff don't want to come in and do the grunt work. And so, Absolutely. right? However, if you outsource to a company for a country, something like, like for example, India, India is very process driven um, and really, really sees the value of doing the individual the individual pieces that need to come together. And so if you're if you just match the work with the personality of the person that wants to do the work, you actually can come up with some really great outcomes. Um, yeah, Heather, 100%. Heather, you're nodding. Come off mute and tell <laughs> us your thoughts. No, I was just agreeing with what with what you said about, you know, in a hundred percent that that the universities need to align with industry because that's yeah. in, in my opinion where the big gap is and yeah. you see you see that they are in other industries outside of accounting like tech um you know and and it's they're very much integrated into you know what's happening in industry being incorporated into things like innovation labs and um you know and uh, yeah those types of incubator programs, right? And so the academics and business are going side by side towards the next. And we're not doing that in accounting. And we right. need to be doing that in accounting because that's where accounting is right now, is that we are on the cusp of something different. And, and we need a makeover. We do. And we, but, but we- and It's actually an image makeover because it's already happening, right? All this exciting is. stuff is happening. We just don't, we just haven't like communicated it out to the, the broader public. But you've got these tenured professors in here that learned accounting 20, 30 years ago that yeah. are not investing in the technology piece of where accounting is right now. Yeah. So we've got we've got it's it's there definitely is a change that's needed and and, and it will happen. It's just happening a little bit slower than I think is I think it can be a bit threatening. I, yeah. I want to add, I want to add um makeover, absolutely. But I think um there needs to be a shift within before we can shift the perspective mm -hmm. that others hold, others yeah. who are not yet in hold. Yeah. I think that's very key. Yeah. Do the, do the, the, the internal work. Internal work um, first. Yeah. Uh, Jamie has a really great comment um, and I want to read it out because I think it's a really good one. Offshoring forces a firm to look at work by tasks rather than roles. An offshore team member doesn't replace a, or complete or compete with an onshore resource. It just removes 30% of their time consuming tasks and allows scale. And so most firms that get through their first year offshore will go on to scale their onshore team. And I know, Matthew, you mentioned, thank you, Jamie, for that comment. That was great. Matthew, I know you mentioned that it takes about a year to get to get up to speed, doesn't it, and get into the groove? So, can you can you well, share that share that those insights with us? 
Yeah, one of the lessons we learned in the Philippines and also St. Lucia, it was it took a full year for us to see all the cultural differences, all the uh, nuances, uh, the deals with uh, how people are usually employed in those countries, like are they on temporary contracts? Are they permanent employment? What those things mean in those different places? How sick leave in St. Lucia is just crazy. Uh, it's just like, like people are like, if they're taking sick time, like we take away their computer and like, it's like a big thing during COVID that was like, just kind of crazy uh, to us. What? Um, what? Well, they, they take away their computer. Well, Sorry. Yeah, that, that, I, the, I mean, what? The, it was like, no, they can't take their computers home. Oh, they and, can't. And they can't like, work like, when they're sick. Yeah. So they were like, that was a big. That's a countrywide thing. In and Saint in Lucio. France, it is illegal to to email someone outside of work hours. Did you know that? So yeah. th these all these little things you figure out over the. First I want to live in France, by the and way. It, and it took yeah. about a year in each jurisdiction to really to understand get, it. To really get our feet under ourselves like yeah the, the, and like, and then get up to get up to the speed yeah um, and when you're like oh there's a 13th month payroll in the philippines like like okay uh we should have saved for that probably so it's like it's like a guarantee oh we have 13 months in the year all of a sudden yeah so these are really interesting things i think um how would you recommend um that you get up that you learn these things like do you uh i guess well, i guess the firm that you're going through can like Toa would be your good guy for that, yeah, right? For the Philippines, yeah. uh, Nick at Toa was really the, mm. the most helpful for me personally. And uh, mm. Toa in general and their their whole staff that was working with us was really helpful for us learning uh, the stuff in the Philippines and then grow resources in St. Lucia, um, kind of where we are and why we're creating an, uh, an entity in the Philippines now is kind of at about 20 people is mm -hmm. kind of where the economics start breaking down. And, and so you now can, you're going to you're going to hire them internally and have an actual legal entity that's a, a subsidiary uh, of or just yeah, a, a subsidiary of Acuity Acuity Philippines. Yeah. And but it's taking a year to figure that out. <laughs> like it's like you you better have good partnerships because uh, it's kind of crazy and you got to jump through a bunch of hoops and just get yeah. your bank account set up is just a thing. We've been doing working on it for about a year. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly. I just want to add something. Yeah. So. Matthew's firm is a little larger, but I think also something to keep in mind when you're outsourcing to you know companies in the other in other countries. I worked with analytics in the past, and um, Double World was another one. When you're smaller, you also have to remember that you're not their only client. So they're have you know they're dealing with deadlines from working with other accounting firms or sometimes small businesses. Um, they also have different holidays. So there's going to be, and how they celebrate those different holidays, you know, it may be where we look at it. It's one holiday. It could be a whole week. It's something we're not familiar with. Um, and so I think timing is something that you kind of have to adjust to, uh, timing on, you know, how quickly they can, com can complete something, but then also the other parts of what they have going on. So that starts to become where it's not just process, it's getting used to kind of that cadence and, and knowing, you know, kind of guessing when things are going to be able to be done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think we've got some people asking if they can come off mute. I'm not, I didn't set up the webinar so that we could take people off mute. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, but Karim has a, has a comment about when you raise minimum salaries, you increase prices causing inflation. Um, that could be a bit controversial to say, because I think we'd all agree that people want to earn more money. Um, but thank you for that. Um, and Ronaldo, if you've got a question, we'd be happy to happy to answer it. Um, and we'd be all we'd be fine there. Um, so so there are always controversies and always things that you have to adjust to. Um, but what in the, in the 10 minutes that we have left, I'd love to cover more questions and things. That would be great. Um, but let's go around and um, Heather, I'd like you to summarize what you think. If there was one thing from Heather on either outsourcing or automation, what would be the one thing that you'd want people to, to take away from this? So that I, I think the one thing that I would say to people is if you haven't started automating, just pick one thing. Just pick one thing, research it, ask your peers, and then do it, do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of automation in tools you're already using that you probably have not employed. And it is a life change changer. And, you know, you're going to save time that you can either use 
for work-life harmonization or to grow your business. Now I'm going to press you. How do you identify that one thing? So where do you start? Where, how, how do I go? I love what Matthew said earlier about writing down what your processes are. And Mm -hmm. I actually recommend with, you know, the clients that I have, you know, worked with is we do what's called a process inventory. A process inventory. inventory is, you know, think of a spreadsheet with columns and rows and you've got your list of clients and then you have the different processes that you do in your firm. And then you Mm -hmm. just put an X next to each client that uses that process. And then you start to see which clients have commonalities between them. And that's where you can start to focus. As far as automating your life, there's lots of ways that you can automate in your life that's not related to clients. So a perfect example is scheduling software. Oh my gosh, Calendly. Calendly, Acuity. You know, game changer, total game changer. And that is automation and that will literally change your life. Mm-hmm. So if you are not using anything, you're still playing the, the email chasing scheduling regimen in your life. You're just torturing. Stop the madness. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the other one is canned emails. Every email client has canned emails. Yeah. Can Templates. Email. Templates. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, Kelly, let's go to you quickly. What is your main takeaway you think from on either offshoring, outsourcing or or I automating? Think, I think the takeaway is actually the same for both. Um, mm-hmm. So for a lot of people, it seems that it's, it's more of a scary thing than anything else. Like in the beginning, when I first started, I mean, and most of you guys probably know this, but like I had started on desktop, I knew nothing about cloud, anything, automation, none of the things. And so it wasn't until I went to a conference and took a couple of webinars and kind of started to learn the little bits and pieces and that it didn't have to be everything. Yeah. So, so conferences like and I webinars. Woke up yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> I woke well, up and, one also, day and I was like, that's it. We're changing yeah. everything. Yeah. It's just a little and, bit. And, and do it at like, I think, okay. So to sum up with Heather and Kelly, pick some things that are going to make a big difference you know, learn about it and then, and then, you know, be guided by experts. Start with, start with the baby stuff. Like I did with my Zapier auto reply kind of thing. Or Calendly. Or Calendly. Well, no, I meant the auto reply to my leads, but yes, I use Acuity for scheduling for everything. And the link that they get when they email me is that link. (laughs) Yep. Um, but I think then as you start to get a little more comfortable with either look at what's going to make the most impact and that's kind of where to make the change. Yeah. Um, the the outsourcing side of things ironically the biggest stigma came from more like my family and friends than my clients my clients were fine with it because they didn't want to go find a company to work with and they were happy to have me manage the process and look at the work and review it but it was like my mom was like what yeah jobs overseas and I was like people have to get over it I would love to hear your opinion on this and the reality is they don't have an answer for that they gotta they gotta get over it yeah. Maxine, what about main takeaways from you? Yeah, I, I think that uh, AI is one of the keys to the mm-hmm. issues that the accounting mm-hmm. profession is facing right now. I think that yeah. we need to leverage AI to solve some of the issues, solve some of the, you know, the overwork issues, the even the job satisfaction issues, because accounting yeah. has become a technologically focused profession and um shouldn't we be selling it that way shouldn't we mm-hmm. be marketing it that way from the perspective of higher education as we mm-hmm. educate students as we reach out to them in uh in the high schools um the aicpa is pushing to make accounting a stem profession so that um it, it absolutely should be exactly yep. Right. And so yeah. you'll be promoting it as a yeah. tech deal. And yeah. it should be because I think it's going to help us to solve a lot of the issues. I don't think that the old, we know that the old model is out. <laughs> we know that. But I think there are some who are still holding on to the old model, you know, yeah. with, you know, they're, they're gripping and they're not letting go. Um, so I think that AI holds a lot of our answers to, yep. to changing the nature of the per- profession and the perception that people hold regarding the, the profession. Yeah, and we don't know where that's all going to roll out. This is really interesting. We're right on the beginning of, you know, of a new, really a new era here. So it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, where we're all going to, um, oh, Andrew's got a funny, funny, um, 
think manual processing fax machines and checks oh my yeah and matthew let's um let's go ahead and give you some time to wrap up your main takeaways here from what you think and what, what you think people should consider as they move forward yeah, one thing I didn't talk about was uh, one of the reasons why outsourcing was or offering them was easier for us is that we were already a virtual firm. So we were already yes. a virtual firm. Mm -hmm. We already had mechanisms for monitoring work deliverables and things like that for remote employees. Mm -hmm. So the next step to outsourcing or offshoring was negligible for us. It was learning yeah. cultures and stuff like that. So I don't want to be remiss. If you're in an in-office setting or if you're a solopreneur, like it, part of that is creating those processes that whether it's the US or international, you have to have these mechanisms to monitor work, uh, to track folks, to train. Like yeah. if, in, if you don't have those things built in already in a remote environment, it makes offshoring and uh, outsourcing a little bit more difficult. So I didn't want to be remiss and say it's the only way to go because in an in-office setting, I think it, it, it's, it's a different... Yeah skill set and you might have to do it anyway to keep up with just the the flow of like how people are working and the the shortage of people um but uh, well I, my experience was yeah my experience is a really great thing that you've just you've just raised there because my experience in 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 outsourcing was literally almost 20 years ago like oh my gosh right literally 2020 you know 2004 and well you know it's going to be 2024 i can't believe it um but we were all in office but it didn't matter because we had really great processes and we used leverage the offshore team as as part of our team that worked while we slept. So for us, it was all about increasing our capacity and getting and focusing for us to be able to focus on the higher level things, which was more joyful work for us. So um, mm. I think the fact that the fact that most of us are working remotely in some form means that you're already set up for success pretty much. Like you can actually take that step. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, now I want to, um, Chell has a great comment about people shopping overseas all the time. I think that's kind of like, get over yourself. You can, you can outsource. And then Heather has a question um, uh, for you. I think, I think it's for you, Matthew. How do you pay your outsourcers? Is it by the hour, the task or the project? Uh, we have two mechanisms for doing that. Um, we have most, I would say 80% of our folks are on salary. Um, okay. So we manage them, um, but we have promotion tiers based on book of business they carry. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have to meet certain thresholds and performance evaluations are related to um, quality and quantity. So quantity part relates to the amount of book of business they manage. And then a certain number of our people, um, yeah. like the virtual administrator uh, admins um, are hourly based employees, typically um, yeah. that's people that are doing um VA stuff. I don't know. Yeah, if yeah, has I, that yeah, purpose. yeah. You have admin. Yeah, and admins can be. I think admin is usually the place where people start. Funnily that enough. is that is where like we a, started. We started yeah. in sales and admin with mm -hmm. our offshoring, um, mm -hmm. and then um, from there we went to the accounting. But the accounting folks we use, uh, we've had better success with uh, paying salaries. Yeah, and and they're highly qualified individuals typically. Some of them will be chartered accountants and, you know, I mean, very highly qualified. So it's an interesting comment string going, um, Linda's Linda's um, chiming in that um, Linda and Julie are having a little bit of a chat saying, um, basically, I'm paraphrasing, tired about hearing of the labor shortage when there's a glut of age discrimination going on. Um, as a person of a certain age myself, I, I lean in there as well. And I hope that people will um, will get over that. Um, because an experienced person who knows what they're doing, um, there's this idea that, you know, people can't learn new skills or not, or we're not lifelong learners. Guess what we are. So um, Linda, get in touch with me and I'll hook you up with some people who are looking for, looking for people. Right oh. here, right here, <laughs> right you're here. So you're looking, I, you're looking for people to hire? Uh, absolutely. And our okay. controller team, uh, I, I would agree with her like that. I am I, I used to be under the average age. I'm about four, I'm 48, so I'm 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 I think I'm under the average age still in our controller team. Oh, that's Although awesome! I so that average, everybody. obviously, so, that's so yeah. So so we have a pretty good range. Um, but uh, I, I agree oh, with you. Oh, look at all these people chiming in. Linda will take you. Okay, Linda, I think you're not going to have a, tra a challenge. <laughs> We have an open job, acuity.co, open job position. That's my give, the, your give back to me is you can, uh, yeah, yeah, like that would be great. 
Oh, I love it. This is great. All right. Well, we unfortunately are at time. Um, I hope everybody um, enjoyed this because I sure did. And um, I think there was a lot of meat here and a lot of layers that we can uncover. And I hope that all of you will reach out to, you know, Kelly, Heather, Maxine, Matthew, reach out to them and, um, and keep the conversation going. So thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate it. And Davida has posted our next webinar, um, which is on um, increasing capacity in your firm. So it's a related, a related topic. So solving the capacity crisis in your, in your firm. And, um, and Linda, one of the things I'm going to make sure I mention is don't forget to hire older people. Dun, da, da, da. That's going to be my mention in that, in that webinar. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to my amazing panelists thank and thank you to everybody for their attention today. I really appreciate all of you. Take care you. and have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye-bye.